Welcome viewers to the second segment of the fourth lecture for the online series of lectures for the course of Algebraic Topology 2. Towards the end of previous segment, we defined a homomorphism between the chain groups given a simply shell map between the underlying spaces of two simply shell complexes. Later, in terms of lemma 1, we we saw how such a map, such a chain map between the chain groups induces a homomorphism between the respective homology groups. Okay, so in, in this segment, we are going to start with, with, with the lemma. Let me state the lemma first and then I'll prove it. Lemma 2, the chain map that we defined in the previous segment, uh, which we denoted by F hash, preserves the augmentation map epsilon. Augmentation map epsilon. Therefore, it induces a homomorphism homomorphism f star of reduced homology groups okay now, a few facts, I'm not going to prove this uh, statement of lemma 2. Uh, I now state a few facts about simplicial approximation. Facts related to simplicial approximation. Approximation. definition let h from mod k to mod l be a continuous map okay just a continuous map between these two topological spaces we say that h satisfies the star condition star condition with respect to k and l with respect to the complexes k and l if for each vertex V of K, there is a vertex W of L such that H of star of V is contained in star of W. Okay. So this is the definition of a continuous map uh, satisfying a star condition. Now the definition of uh, simply shell approximation. Definition. Let again H from mod K to mod L be a continuous map. Continuous map if f from mod k to mod l is a simplicial map simplicial map such that 
h of star of v is contained in star of f of v okay this we number by 4 we number by this containment by 4 okay this means that h satisfies a star con the star condition right satisfies the star condition with respect to k and l to k and l all right because you see that in in the in the definition of star condition we wanted a w so that this containment is fulfilled right in this case in this specific case uh, w is equal to f of v all right which means that h satisfies um, the star condition with respect to k and l and it has to be satisfied for each vertex v of k okay if if this is fulfilled for each vertex v of k then f is called a simplicial approximation approximation to h so um right so uh, in in other words we are approximating this continuous map satisfying the star condition by means of this simplicial map f okay all right now a remark following the definition of simplicial approximation equation 4 implies that h satisfies the star condition relative to star condition relative to k and l in other words whenever a continuous map whenever a continuous map h from mod k to mod l satisfies the star condition whenever it satisfies the star condition one can find one can find its simply shell approximation simply shell approximation that is one can find a simplicial map simplicial map f from mod k to mod l satisfying h of star of v contained in star of f of v for every vertex v of k vertex v of k all 
right? Now, since any simply shield map, any simply shield map f from mod k to mod l induces induces a group homomorphism f star at p which is a map from HP of K to HP of L. Okay. Um, so this is the story for F being a um, simply shell map, right? So since uh, for for any simply shell any such simply shell map we can induce a group homomorphism at the level of the homology groups for any continuous map which does not need to be a simply shell map for any continuous map H from mod K to mod L satisfying star condition star condition relative to K and L there is a well-defined well-defined group homomorphism H star at P at the level of the homology groups which takes HP of K to HP of L okay so it tells us that in the case when H is just a continuous map satisfying the start condition relative to K and L, we can also induce a group homomorphism at the level of the homology groups, which is given by H star of P. And this is obtained by setting H star to be equal to F star. Where F is the simplicial approximation to H. Okay. Where F is a simplicial approximation approximation to H. Right? So um, this fact tells us that even when H is just a continuous map satisfying the star condition relative to the given two complexes K and L, we are good. We can still induce a group homomorphism at the level of homology groups. Okay. All right, let me erase everything. Now, this is another fact. Now, the problem that we are confronted with is that any continuous map H from mod K to mod L may not satisfy the star condition relative to, relative, relative to K and L, may not satisfy the star condition relative to K and L in general. So what do we do then? 
there is a useful technique technique called subdivision which is yet to be defined we have not defined this term subdivision yet so this useful technique called subdivision by means of which one can form a new complex form a new complex k prime out of this old complex k with the same underlying space it is important they should have the same underlying space that is mod k should be the same as mod k prime okay so one builds a new complex k prime out of this given complex k so that they have the same underlying space and mm, and uh, h the map h from mod k to mod l does satisfy the star condition relative to k prime and l this time relative to this new complex k prime and l relative to k prime and L okay so um, so we start with uh, with a continuous map between the underlying spaces of the given two complexes which does not satisfy the star star condition relative to the given complexes K and L first and then we, we using uh, uh, a technique called subdivision we build a new complex k prime out of this old complex k having the same underlying space as uh, mod k that is k mod k prime is is the same as mod k and um, h from mod k to mod l does satisfy the star condition relative to k prime and l okay so now let me give you the definition of this subdivision, this term subdivision definition of subdivision. Let K be a geometric complex in the generalized Euclidean space E to the J. A complex K prime is said to be a subdivision of K of this given complex K if the following two conditions are fulfilled. Each simplex of K prime each simplex of k prime is contained in a simplex of k okay so for example let us take this one dimensional simplex okay so there are two vertices v0 and v1 connected by an edge so this is an oriented one simplex okay now i don't need an orientation for the moment so let let us have this one dimensional simplex v0 v1 okay 
Now, let me put another vertex here on this edge and call it V2. Okay. So, um, so V0 to V1, when we had this old simplex, we denoted by K, and now after putting this uh, new vertex, we call it K prime. So we can immediately see that each simplex of k prime is contained in a simplex of k. In particular, v0, v2 is, is a one-dimensional simplex in k prime and that is contained in v0, v1. Similarly, v2, v1 is a one-dimensional simplex of k prime that is contained in the one-dimensional simplex v0, v1, okay? So, the, pro the first property is satisfied for this example. The second condition tells us that each simplex of k equals the union are finitely many simplices of k prime simplices of k prime so in 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 this example it's a it's a pretty simple example in this example there is just a k it, there is only one simplex in in the in k okay and there are two one simplices in k prime namely v0 v2 and v2 v1 okay so um, the simplex the one simplex v0 v1 of k is the union of these two one dimensional simplices v0 v2 and v2 v1 of k prime right so we see that um, in in our example, in this example of k and k prime, where both these simply both these complexes are have uh, one dimension, both these complexes are of dimension one. Um, both the conditions of subdivision are fulfilled. Okay. Right, and hence k prime in this example is a subdivision. Of the complex K. All right. Now another definition. Definition it's about subdivision of P plus one skeleton of the given complex K from the subdivision of the p skeleton of the complex k okay it gives you the algorithm of finding the subdivision of uh, of of a p plus 1 skeleton of the p plus 1 skeleton of the given complex k from the subdivision of p skeleton of the complex k let K be a complex. Suppose that L sub P is a subdivision of the P skeleton, P skeleton K. P of K. Let me draw a picture for you here. Uh, let me give you the example with the help of a one skeleton of a given two-dimensional complex. So, so let us denote our uh, complex by K. It's a two-dimensional complex. Okay. So there is one two simplex 
in K and there are there are four one simplices and there are four zero simplices okay so how many there are one two simplices sorry one two simplex plus four one simplices and four zero simplices which are vertices okay this is our k now so what is, what is this one skeleton of this complex k k1 is the union of all the one simplices here and all the zero simplices so it consists of this boundary of the triangle and this one simplex is is the union of this boundary of the triangle and the and the one simplex that is the one skeleton okay now now what is lp l sub p in this case let us introduce this subdivision here okay so this is lp so lp consists of um, these these one simplices and these zero simplices okay that's lp it's a subdivision of k1 one skeleton okay so far so good so we 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 are trying to understand what i what i have written here in terms of the example on the right side let sigma p r p plus 1 simplex of k okay so what is sigma here sigma is the two simplex so in our case in the example that we are studying p is equal to 1 okay so we are focused so there is only one two simplex here which is sigma so this is this is sigma in this example the set BD sigma is the polytope polytope of a subcomplex of KP subcomplex of KP so in our case BD sigma is this guy So obviously this guy, the union of these things, this this is the one simplex, this is the one simplex, this is the one simplex. They are all one simplices. And they are how many zero simplices? One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six zero simplices, and there are these one simplices. If you take the union of all these things, what you get is 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 a is a subcomplex right the subcomplex of this whole thing which is the one skeleton so we in this case this is l1 boundary bd sigma is a polytope of a subcomplex of kp and hence a subcomplex of 
LP, right? Okay. We denote this subcomplex that we have drawn here. Denote the latter subcomplex subcomplex by L sigma. So in this case, this is L sigma. So it is evident that L sigma is a subcomplex of L1. Okay. Good. Now choose an interior point of this P plus 1 simplex sigma. Choose an interior point, point W sigma of sigma. Then the cone W sigma star L sigma is a complex whose underlying space is just sigma. Okay, look at here, um, we choose an interior point, let's choose this interior point, we denote it by W sigma and then form the cone by, by joining W sigma to different vertices of L sigma like this. So, W sigma star L sigma is going to be the union of all these two simplices. How many two simplices are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six two simplices. And the union of all these six two simplices in this example is a complex whose underlying space is, is sigma. The the two simplex that we started with. Okay. So this is how we get the cone starting from an interior point of the of the two simplex. Uh, let me erase this part of the definition. I still need the figure so I keep it intact. Now Mm. We define we define L sub P plus one to be the union of L sub P okay. and and the complexes W sigma star L sigma. Okay, so this is LP. Okay, starting from here, which is a one dimensional subcomplex of, of the given complex K. L, L1, right? So we define L2 to be the union of L1. This is L1 and all these and all these six two simplices. 
okay so that's going to be um, L2 for this example. So L2 is L1 union the six two simplices that we have discussed already. Um, so, um, right. Is the union of LP and the complexes W sigma star L sigma as sigma ranges over all P plus one simplices of K? Okay. In this example, there is just one two simplex, so we are just having this L one union the union the six two simplices here okay but in case if we have uh, more p plus one simplices like like the case of a tetrahedron okay we will have more more objects to take union of okay hmm. now one can show we are not doing it one can show that L sub P plus 1 is a simply shell complex. We'll not prove it here. The complex L sub P plus 1 is said to be the subdivision of the p plus 1 skeleton p plus 1 skeleton k p plus 1 obtained obtained subdivision of the p plus 1 skeleton k p plus 1 obtained by Starring, starring LP from the points W sigma, starring LP from the points W sigma, it's called stirring of W, uh, stirring this L sigma this LP, the whole thing, from the points, the, in, uh, the interior point W sigma. Okay, now we consider a special case when we choose this interior point to be the barycenter of the, um, of the, of the P plus one simplex. Okay, so in the definition we, we just say that this interior point can be anything inside the inside the p plus one simplex right we did not put any restriction on 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 the coordinates of this interior point but now we are going to put restriction on it and uh, see a special case all right let me erase everything definition Barry Center if Sigma from V0 all the way up to VP is an unoriented unoriented P simplex with the given vertices given vertices the barycenter of this unoriented p simplex sigma the barycenter of sigma is defined to be to be 
it's denoted by sigma hat and it's equal to the sum of all terms 1 over p plus 1 times vi i ranges from 0 to p okay so uh, remember from um, our knowledge uh, what we studied in algebraic topology one that um, any point in in the in the given p simplex right um, can be written as a linear combination of the of the vertices right where the the coefficients of the linear combinations are called barycentric coordinates of the given point so we see that for the barycenter, the barycentric coordinates are all equal, which are given by 1 over p plus 1, right? It's also called centroid in the, in the literature of physics or in mechanics to be more precise. Okay. So this is equation number 5, which gives us the expression of the... Um, mm, of the barycenter. Observe in 5 that the barycentric coordinate of sigma hat, what I just, just said, uh, so, uh, the, the barycentric coordinate of sigma hat with respect to all the vertices v0 all the way up to vp are all equal. This is given by 1 over p plus 1 and the sum of all these coordinates are According to what we have learned earlier, it, the sum of all the barycentric coordinates is supposed to be 1, right? So let, let's see what it turns out to be in this case. 1 over p plus 1 times p plus 1. There are p plus 1 many 1 over p plus 1. So the sum of all these 1 over p plus 1s is equal to 1, okay? as it should be. In other words, the width of the barycenter sigma hat on each of these vertices v0, v1, all the way up to vp is given by 1 over p plus 1. Okay. All right. Now the definition of barycentric subdivision of k p plus 1 from the subdivision of kp. Okay. Barycentric subdivision of kp plus 1 from the subdivision of kp. Okay, let K be a given complex. We define a sequence of subdivisions of the skeletons of K. Skeletons of K as follows okay so let let us start with with the set of vertices okay or the zero skeleton let l0 is which is just k0 zero, the zero skeleton of k skeleton of k. It's just L0. There is nothing to do here. In general, if Lp is a subdivision of the p skeleton k, Let L sub P plus 1 be the subdivision of K P plus 1 
obtained by starring LP LP from the Barry Center. of the p plus one simplices simplices of k all right so let us get back to our old example where we were dealing with this two-dimensional complex k okay so in this case we are going to choose the interior point to be the midpoint of the all one simplices right because that has to be that that point the interior point has to be the barry center so this is here this is also a midpoint here this is a midpoint here this is a midpoint here okay and the interior point of these two simplex has to be its barry center in other words, it has to be this point. This point. So that the picture looks uniform. So this is the barycentric, the first barycentric subdivision of the of the of the one two-dimensional complex that we started with. Okay. Okay, the union, the union of the, of the complexes LP, so obtained for starting from zero all the way up to one, two, goes on like that. Um, can be seen to be a can be seen to be a subdivision subdivision using standard results that I'm not going to do here using standard results It is called the first barycentric subdivision of K. It is called the first barycentric subdivision division of K and is denoted by SDK. Okay. All right. Now, what about the second barycentric subdivision? Let me erase everything. So, before that, I draw uh, the picture of what we are trying to do. In the context of our old example, this is the two dimensional complex that we started with. um v0 v1 let me label the vertices this time this is v3 and this is sigma okay this is k now the first barycentric subdivision as we have discussed earlier is as follows So we choose the midpoint of all these one simplices and then form the cone this is sigma hat the interior point is the Barry center this is v0 v1 v2 and v3 
this is STK, the first barycentric subdivision. So um, what do we do? We now, now having formed, having formed a complex, so we formed a complex STK, right? The first barycentric subdivision of the given complex K. We can now construct now construct um, the barycentric subdivision of this new complex S D of K. It's first barycentric subdivision subdivision S D of S D K which we denote by denote by S D square of K. This complex, this new complex that we just formed is called the second barycentric subdivision of K. Barry centric subdivision of K. One can go on like this and define ST and K in general. Okay. Okay, let's see how the second Barry centric subdivision looks like. So let me draw. A little bigger diagram. This is the complex. This is the Barry Center. Okay. Now we further subdivide it. So these are the subdivided one synthesis. So when I do this, I get something like this. Similarly, I have to do it for all the all the six two simplices that we obtain from the first barycentric subdivision. So this is the second barycentric subdivision for the given complex K. This is the complex that we started with K. This is SD square K. Okay. So the figure tells us how the two-dimensional complex K, uh, uh, its first barycentric subdivision, 
and its second barycentric subdivision look like. Okay. All right. Good. Now we are in a state to 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 state our second theorem called the finite simply shell approximation theorem. Theorem two. The finite simply shell approximation theorem. Let K and L be complexes. Also let K be finite. Given a continuous map H from the underlying space of K to the underlying space of L, there is a natural number N such that H has a simply shell approximation we know what it means by a simpler simply shell approximation F from S D N K to L. Okay. We also um, we also studied what it means by S D N of K, right? It's the nth barycentric subdivision of K. Okay. And S D N of K and K have the same underlying space, which is just mod K. All right. One in in the proof one needs to show that H the continuous map uh, from mod K to mod L satisfies the star condition condition relative to SD, N, K, and L. Okay. That's the punchline. One needs to approve this um, during the you know during the proof of theorem two. All right. All right, now a few, and another important thing here, let K0 be a subcomplex of K, subcomplex of K, and let L0 be a subcomplex subcomplex of L. Okay, K0 is a subcomplex of K and L0 is a subcomplex of L. Let F from K to L be a simplicial map that carries you know usually we write it like this so let's put it like this sometimes you write it without the mod sign but you know essentially you mean the same thing that carries each simplex c 
simplex each simplex of the subcomplex k0 to a uh, simplex of the subcomplex l0 of l we often describe this situation as f from k comma k0 to l comma l0 is a simplicial map Okay, so, but when we write this, that f from k comma k0 to l comma l0 is a simplicial map, simplicial map, we mean that f from mod k to mod l is a simplicial map that carries each simplex of k0 to a simplex of l0. Okay. And whenever th this is the situation, we we have an induced map. This this induces a map f star at p in the relative chain group C p of k comma k zero to C p of l comma l zero. Okay, I'm not going into the detail of these things. So I just wanted to you know mention the facts. All right. All right. Now our theorem three, which is a refinement of theorem two, it it, it also holds for the infinite dimensional case. Theorem three, the general simplicial approximation theorem. The general simplicial approximation theorem. Let K and L be complexes. Complexes. Also let H from mod K to mod L be a continuous map. Continuous map. There exists. A subdivision k prime of k okay so it's no longer barycentric subdivision there is a more general notion that I'm not, not going to uh, go in in detail uh, with um, I'm just mentioning that it's a subdivision k prime of k Okay, we don't have time to go into the details. There exists a subdivision k prime of k such that H has a simplicial approximation approximation f from k prime to l okay this guy is a simplicial map okay so we started with a general continuous map all right which does not need to satisfy any star condition or anything like that it's just a plain continuous map between the underlying spaces of the two given complexes and from which we we can always find a simplicial approximation of H given by F which goes from K prime to L where K prime is a subdivision of K okay so that's the general simplicial approximation theorem all right so we needed to review these facts um, it's not a revision actually we we did not go in, into the detail of these things but 
we needed these facts to for the later purposes. So it's time to take a break and after the break uh, we'll come to the notion of uh, of the zigzag process. Thank you for attending the second segment of the fourth lecture.